Thanks again, everybody, for listening to Diffuse Congruence. This is Zucky, and I'm here with Pervez. Hey, welcome, listeners. Good to be with you again, Zucky. Yeah, so we've started a new endeavor here uh, to enhance the experience that people have listening to Diffuse Congruence. And why don't you give our audience the heads up on that? Yeah, we're really excited about this. We have just launched our Patreon page. So you have a new destination or URL that you can find the latest and greatest about Diffuse Congruence. And in addition to that, you have now the opportunity to participate by not only listening and commenting and being a part of a community community of people that do check out the show, but also you get the opportunity to now support the show financially. If you go to patreon.com slash diffuse congruence, you can find out more about how you can be a part of that endeavor. What we really want is an opportunity to increase not just uh, the quantity of output that we are putting out, but also the quality of output that we're putting out. So we're hoping that you out there in the world will be able to help us out by uh, allowing us to upgrade our equipment and, as necessary, upgrade our production capability and really make this show the best it can be for all of you out there. You know, I know, Zucky, when you and I started out and, you know, when when we put our brains together to kind of come up with the idea of the podcast and what we wanted it to be. You and I, you know, realized that if we were going to be preserving and capturing the stories uh, of the likes of Dr. Omar Farouk Abdullah or Osama Kanin or Imam Zaid Shakir or, you know, the list goes on and on and on and on. But if we're if we're capturing their stories, we want to do it in the best form using the best technology available to us. And so you know, we're only able to do that so much with on our own, and so we thought this would be a great opportunity to allow our listeners out there to kind of contribute by becoming a monthly patron of uh, the Diffuse Congruence podcast. Patreon.com slash Diffuse Congruence. You can find out more about how you can become a patron and, and, and what um, different levels of sponsorship and patronship, if you will, uh, gets you little prizes and little opportunities to be a part of the show. So our goal is to continue the momentum we've had over the last uh, five years. It's hard to believe, coming up on five years now. We want to keep that enthusiasm and that energy going as we expand in new and interesting directions. And the only way we can really do that is with your help and your continued not only spiritual support, but, yes, your financial support, too. So we're really hoping you will join us as we take Diffuse Congruence into the next leg of its hopefully lengthy journey. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, if I could just add one final note to what Zucky said earlier in terms of what your valuable contribution can do, in addition to allowing us to kind of up our production quality and, and get better equipment, um, you know, we want to we want to get the word out. Uh, so far, again, you know, going on as many years as we as we've been doing the show, it's been exclusively we have relied on essentially word of mouth of our listeners, and um, you know uh, that has gotten us this far, and we're re- and we're really grateful grateful to that. But I think that with uh, a little bit more investment um, into some advertising and promotional uh, uh, endeavors out there, we can get help. We can help spread the word because uh, Zucky and I feel very confident in the fact that all it is, is it's a matter of people listening to the show. I think the content sort of speaks for itself. It's really just about introducing audiences to the show. Please do uh, visit patreon.com slash diffuse congruence. Become a patron today and you can become a monthly patron and uh, it'll really help us in putting out the best podcast and the best diffuse congruence that we can put out there. So that website, once again, is patreon.com slash diffuse congruence. Sign up to be a patron today and you will start to see the impact of your contribution almost immediately. So thank you once again for supporting us, for coming up on five years, and we're hoping we can keep that energy and that enthusiasm coming for a long time to come. Welcome to Diffuse Congruence. This is episode 64 of the American Muslim Experience. My name is Zaki Hassan, and I'm here with Pervez Ahmed. Hey, welcome back, everyone. Uh, good to be back with you, Zaki. And uh, how are you doing today? 
I'm, been a minute since we've talked. It, it always has been. I feel it, that way. It's been a while, but it's bright and early on Sunday morning, and uh, I'm, couldn't be happier to be here doing the show. You know, that's right. Here we are, uh, beautiful spring months, and uh, Ramadan. It seems to be you know creeping along the corner. So exciting, exciting times. Yeah, and and I'm very excited to welcome our guest for this episode. We're going to be joined by Shane Atkinson. Shane is from a Southern Baptist background and grew up in Jackson, Mississippi. He sat with spiritual teachers from the major religious traditions over a 10-year period and accepted Islam in 1999. In 2011, he was awarded in Ijazah to teach the foundation of Islamic theology, law, and spirituality. Shane is the Muslim Life Coordinator at Elon University and teaches mentors and provides emotional and spiritual support for converts in North Carolina. Shane, thank you so much for coming on the show. Assalamualaikum. Waalaikumsalam. It sounds impressive when you read it. <laughs> well, well, uh, just to get the ball rolling, tell us about that. I mean, uh, you come from a fairly unique background in terms of your journey to Islam. So, so uh, talk about that that ten year uh, uh, period that led up to your embracing the faith. Well, uh, that ten years started after I was. Uh, I was already really interested in in Islam. Like uh, I'm I'm older than you guys, so the hip hop music in the late '80s and early '90s, uh, you know, that was a very powerful time. And uh, I heard Malcolm X mention, read the autobiography of Malcolm X, and then I uh, I was looking to connect with Muslims, and then uh, uh, I, I met different groups of people and. Uh, then I decided, yeah, you know, it just doesn't feel quite right. So I kept, I kept searching and I would go sit with teachers from different traditions and, uh, spend time with them. And I think I wasn't finding what I was looking for. I think I was trying to find the magic word so I could get everything that my ego wanted. Hmm. But a lot of these traditions kept telling me over and over that it's freedom lies in being of service to other people. Mm -hmm. And, um, I was at a Rumi festival in uh, Chapel Hill, North Carolina in 1999. And there was a brother there from the Bay Area named Imam Bilal Hyde. And um, he was a, a chaplain at San Quentin. And uh, when, I, when I met him, I realized that oh, it, it was possible for me to be Muslim, too. But I'd never seen a white, pers- uh, white Muslim person in, ever. You know, maybe I saw Sheikh Hamza or Sheikh... Uh, Abdul Hakim Murad, like on a videotape, sure. VHF tape. I, I didn't know that people existed like that. I mean, <laughs> theoretically, you could be Muslim, but I never met someone in person. So that kind of opened, uh, I think, the door for me to to step in through. You know, so so kind of like from your perspective at that time, from the outside looking in, it was like a Muslim is either somebody who's native to the East, quote unquote, or an African American. I think that's the only uh, representations of Islam that I've ever seen. I can remember being a kid and seeing like the Iranian revolution and the hostages on the news and things like this, you know? So um, yeah, I think definitely Islam would be the last, it'd be the last tradition that you would look at being a white person from the deep South. I mean, that would, uh, but of course, you know, um, Mevlana Jalaluddin Rumi was still poetry was everywhere, and a lot of people were uh, reading this poetry. And uh, well, actually, I had a friend that passed away in 1996, and um, I think that really got me searching for how to make meaning out of life. And hmm. um, I'd lived with a family, uh, shared a, like a little duplex type living situation with a family from Indonesia. Uh, there, the father was working on his PhD at Jackson state university and we would have discussions and he was telling me, he's like, what you're talking about, your outlook on life is is called Sufism. Have you ever heard of that? Hmm. I said, no, I've never heard of that. So he said, you should try to find some, should try to find some books or read up on that. So, um, part of this, the internet wasn't really that happening in those days. So I tried to research on the internet and uh, some of the events that I could find related to maybe spirituality were events where Coleman Barks was reading Rumi poetry. Okay. 
so that's kind of uh, how I got connected. And then uh, right after, I think it was 2000, I went out to Zaytuna. They wanted the, the early Dean intensives, you know. Okay. And that was way over my head at the time. But I'd seen Sheikh Hamza on a videotape, so I knew, oh, there's another person. <laughs> it may be interesting to try to plug into, connect with, because, uh, yeah, I, w- I would be, I would travel to different uh, conferences and stuff, just trying to, uh, on my spiritual quest, you know, so. Yeah. So, but when when you came here in, in 2000 to attend the early uh, Dean Intensive, um, I imagine you meet other white converts, though, right? Besides Sheikh Hamza, just among attendees. Well, it was it was interesting. I was I was sick, and I I, uh, I don't know. I wasn't in I wasn't in good uh, shape when I made it out there. So I did a lot of uh, uh, I wasn't very engaged. But I, I was staying in the in the apartments right next to the old Zaytuna Institute. Hmm, sure. And um, uh, there was a brother Umar there from Dar es Salaam. Right. And uh, and Lukman Williams was there uh, in that it was, it was a bunch of people staying in one room. So I was out of it. You know, I was I was pretty sick, but I, I, I said, I'm going to, you know, make the trip anyway. And the little bit that I got to, to see was uh, was fascinating. I just wasn't ready for that yet. It was a little ab- above my head, like talking about, uh, you know, schools of law and things like this. Uh, things I'd never even heard about. So, uh, but it, it was amazing to see all the people that were speaking at that conference. And I was just thinking about it. Who, who knows, maybe some of those prayers that were made at that conference kind of led me where I'm at, you know, or, or helped, helped me along my way, you know? So I know there was a lot of benefit there, even if I didn't totally understand what was going on. Uh, yeah, all yeah. the beautiful people there, you know, so. Interesting point. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, But, you know, I think um, another fascinating part of your own background is uh, certainly something you've alluded to. But, um, you know, we haven't exactly had a, 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 you know, a Muslim from the deep south, let alone a white, you know, sort of white convert, uh, you know, who comes from, you know, Mississippi. So um, I'd love to kind of hear about that background. You know, I mean, Kind of take us back there for a, for a little bit. Now you now you say you 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 assume that you 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 predate us. Uh, um, so you're growing up in the 70s, I assume, as opposed to the 80s. Yeah. Or okay, right, okay. right, okay, got it. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I was born in 1970. So okay, well, think, okay. You know, I'm one of the. I think I'm the first generation of my family to go to an integrated school. Wow. Uh, and so I grew up uh, interacting with people that my parents didn't have exposure to and times they were changing. Like maybe my parents might say something behind closed doors that they would tell me, you can't say this in public. Oh, wow. You know, cause they were understanding the world's changing. You can't express these things out in the open. Um, and very different landscape that I had to navigate, uh, than my parents did. And it caused a lot of friction, uh, with my parents, but, uh, was that, yeah, my grandfather, my grandfather taught me how to tie a noose when I was about 11 years old. He didn't say what this was for, Wow! but he explained the biomechanics of it. And a few, few different things that I didn't really realize until later, you know, that that was, maybe that was part of my inheritance, you know, that I wasn't really primed to take that on and run with it, especially, being a teenager and interacting with people from different backgrounds and seeing that there's beautiful people, regardless of their color, there's, there's beautiful people that come in all different uh, shades. Right. So that was hard to reconcile that with what my, what my family uh, believed. And it caused, it was uh, some conflict there. Uh, uh, like literal conflict there, you know, surrounding right. that. And at some point I thought either I'm crazy or all these people are crazy. And it turned out they were all crazy, you know? <laughs> so a lot of them have mellowed out over the years where they're, they understand there's a backstory to how things got to be, how they are in Mississippi, you know? And that, um, uh, now even more so they judge people based on their character, not just on their complexion. So, so that's alhamdulillah, you know, 
Yeah. No, I mean, what, you mentioned like your parents talking to you about, you know, stuff that you can't say in public anymore. Was that, you know, because we hear, I think we kind of hear a lot about that or there are conversations around those issues even now. As, you know, we live in a Trump era where, you know, the kind of resentment among white folk and things like that, that's become a real topic of conversation. Um, did that kind of emanate from a place of uh, frustration or, hey, this is just what this is just the reality of the world we live in? Uh, just, I think just the reality, if I'm understanding you right, it was just the way things were changing. Like I can remember Roots being on TV as well. Uh, and, you know, it just wasn't acceptable to use racial slurs out in the open. Part, partially because you would get pushback. Like I can, I can remember being in elementary school and, you know, things go around in elementary school. Like you play a game where you break each other's pencils or, you know, there's little fads that pass around in elementary school and they, they peter out. But um, people were calling each other boy on the playground. That was like the cool thing to do. They kind of joke with each other. So um, so I called uh, a, a black kid boy and he got really, really upset, you know. Wow. But I didn't understand what that meant, you know. So it was just an era where uh, this whole relationship between black and white people was kind of being renegotiated in Mississippi where people were standing up uh, for their right to be treated as a human being, you know? And uh, so, yeah, maybe there may be a racial slur made in the car while we're driving. And I would repeat, I, I can remember repeating that as a little kid and my parents telling me, don't say that. And I, and I think it's not because they didn't believe it at the time, but it's because they know I could get pushed back if I said that in public, you know? Mm, interesting. So, Fascinating. so this is probably earlier than maybe it's a little different dynamic than right now, you know, but, um, well, I, I mean, I'd love to kind of come back to that, kind of get your thoughts on what's going on right now. Uh, but uh, I mean, since we are kind of talking about, um, your own background, um, would you kind of characterize your sort of family roots as, middle class, uh, upper middle class, lower middle class. I mean, kind of where, where, because I know that also factors in when we talk about these kinds of issues, you know, beyond just race, right. We're also talking about, uh, socioeconomic factors. Sure. We're talking about working class people who, um, you know, uh, my family are, they both, they're both from farming families, okay. right. When my grandfather moved, moved to the city and, I grew up in a working class neighborhood that uh, on one end of the neighborhood, there was a trailer park and some people in different parts of the country don't get this joke kind of, but I've seen a velvet Elvis in the wild. <laughs> so that means I've seen Elvis painted on velvet in a trailer, <laughs> not, not making fun of the South, but I've seen that in real life, you know? So yeah. yeah, one end of the neighborhood was a trailer park. And then the street I lived on behind our house was a, a, an empty lot. And then there was a house, there, were, there was a street that was a, a predominantly African-American neighborhood. So uh -huh. I grew up on the side of town, it's called Subdivision Number 2 in Jacktown, in Jackson, Mississippi. So um, I didn't know there were white people from the suburbs until I was in middle, uh, middle school, you know. Uh, so I grew up uh, around uh, black Americans my entire life, really. I mean, we were separated by... Uh, a street or two, but still we went to the same schools and we interacted with each other. And I think that's part of, you know, why, why I see the world the way, the way I do, because I've had maybe more shared experience with black Americans than um, maybe some other, the people that lived in the suburbs or um, yeah, uh, just because of the way the world had changed and the, you know, the proximity of, uh, of us going to school and this type of thing. So. Now you talk about hip hop, uh, like you begin listening to hip hop, I imagine probably middle school, high school. Um, now was that, would you say that was common among, you know, you, you know what I mean? Like among this sort of working class, white kind of, uh, you know, white folk in, in Mississippi, are people listening to hip hop? And if so, what would you say, like what resonated about hip hop? Um, <clears throat> I think with me, I think I saw the movie Wild Style on maybe TBS or something like 
You know, there wasn't much to see on cable uh, in those days. I'm going to defer to Zucky on that one. I haven't heard of that movie. There's a documentary called Wild Style, and it shows Grandmaster Flash scratching in his kitchen, right? (laughs) So um, being my mother played a lot of different types of music. So I think part of it, seeing that hip hop music, it looked and it sounded like something that you didn't have to have a lot of resources to create that kind of music, like being very creative making something out of nothing, right? So to write poetry or rap music, you needed a piece of paper and a pencil. So even if you had limited means, that was, you could express yourself. So I think that was very appealing to me as somebody um, that really loved music. This is a way, you don't have to go buy a $500 guitar or whatever. You can sneak your mother's turntable out when she leaves the house and try to figure out how to scratch on it or write raps, you know? So even if you had limited means that looked like a, a, an avenue of expression. Um, and it wasn't that common. I, uh, for, this was before there were white people at rap concerts. Like I went, me and my, <laughs> my buddy, uh, David Fisher, he was, he was DJing at the skating rink. He was another white guy that was into, uh, hip hop music in the, the early eighties. And, um, when we, we, like we saw public enemy and there were, you know, there's probably 10,000 people and there's like two white people. Right. So it's, it's a totally different world now. This is before it was popular. And then I think once a lot of white people started listening to the music, um, I remember one instance where there was a young guy listening to, I forget what rap music he was listening to. And I was like, Oh, you like rap music too. And he said, yeah, those N words sure can rap. Right. So I was like, uh, yeah, we're not on the same wavelength here, you know, <laughs> right. uh, because wow. this, yeah. you know, this, um, this music exposed me to, uh, a whole nother world and right. a whole way of under making sense out of the landscape I was navigating. It really helped provide the backstory for the situation that I found myself in and reading autobiography of Malcolm X and getting to learn a little bit about Islam. It kind of named some of the beliefs that I, it was it's my fitra. Like some, I believe some of this stuff, but I didn't know it was called Islam. So it was right. very healing for me, this music. And then for someone to look at it like, Oh yeah. Yeah. They can rap good. And, you know, use a derogatory words like that. It was, uh, I think that was more maybe the attitude of people that listened to that music. Uh, a lot of the people that were starting to, because my mother, I think when like Vanilla Ice and MC Hammer got popular, she said, "Why don't you do music like that?" You know, we were more into we were more into like not being a white public enemy, but like more interested in like looking at the situation, critiquing the situation, and uh, more trying to do some type of conscious music, even at that right. time, like pre Beastie Boys. But but uh, when all that came along, and that didn't gra- gain much traction, but. Um, but yeah, my, I remember my mom saying, like, buying the MC Hammer album and buying the Vanilla Ice album. And I was thinking, like, you've never liked this music before. But And her saying, just do something like that. And I was like, yeah, yeah, I can't. Yeah, I don't want to do that. But <laughs> Right. No, you know, it's 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 interesting. And, and I asked this question genuinely, like, not uh, – I'm not kind of framing the conversation. But, um, you know, we, we've talked a lot on this show about hip-hop and the influence of it, of hip-hop and – obviously what that music speaks to um what's what would you say is the sort of musical equivalent uh you know uh to that like you know analogous to that um you know in 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 white circles like what is the hip-hop equivalent of speaking to the condition of and the and the realities of being white in america perhaps being you know working class or poor white in america what is the equivalent of that i mean you know people may say jokingly, well, it's obviously it's country, but I mean, is that true? I mean, what would you say is the real equivalent of that? Well, you're, you're asking someone who, yeah, my mother played like some bluegrass music, but she also played Bob Marley and all this kind of some funky type of music, but definitely country yeah. and bluegrass. I mean, you listen to some of that music, um, that's that's the subject matter of a lot of this music. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Hope to, that you can make it through the trials and tribulations of life. So it's naming the pain that people are experiencing, and then it's also offering them 
uh, hope, you know, that there's a, there's a life beyond this. So I would say, and I didn't grow up, my parents just didn't, weren't into country music, you know? So right. maybe they liked kind of like classic rock or something like that, but, uh, which you've kind of lost some of that. It's more maybe commercialized or something, but, um, bluegrass music and country music and, uh, any type of roots, what now I guess they would call roots music, uh, from mm-hmm. the Appalachia, Appalachian mountains and things like that. But, um, uh, cause even when we talk about yeah. rock, I mean, there's the, there's the, uh, sort of there's the stream of sort of southern rock right like you've got you know uh leonard skinner in alabama and you've got you know credence cc you know so uh yeah. ccr so i mean that that that's the, that that's another sort of stream within american rock that um it certainly exists and is it, it, again speaks to a very unique set of reality realities right. and circumstances so uh yeah I, I just thought as a consumer of music even if not you know, I, I just would love to, I, I just wanted to hear your thoughts on that. So, um, and I, um, and I wanted to just mention this, mention this to you real quick. Cause I think when this conversation happens, I, I just realized like also the black American rock and roll bands from that era were pretty influential on white people too. I don't think that people always think about mentioning like bad brains and fishbone and later like living color, like also black rock bands that were doing music that it resonated with white people musically, but we also got a window into the realities of like gentrification and topics that we may have never known anything about through those early rock bands like Fishbone and uh, Bad Brains and things like, uh, uh, you know, Living Color. So Mm. I forget about that, that that was very influential. It wasn't just Public Enemy. It was Living Color and Fishbone and, and, you know, the song Ghetto Soundwave, uh, could have been written today, you know, the, the uh, reporting on what's actually happening before people could capture this on cell phones. And we all knew what was going on, uh, getting, getting to see a bigger piece of the reality uh, that sometimes right. you're, you're, you don't get to see. So I think that, that was, that they were powerful too, especially with mostly white, a lot, a lot of white people listening to that music, like early on in rap music, a lot of white people bought, were buying that music. So, uh, Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. So it had some people. It was just entertaining. Some people it was uh, it was profound. You know, right, right. Um, now I, I want to kind of maybe go back and circle back to the conversation we were talking about earlier uh, at the outset about kind of your own spiritual journey. Um, do you grow up with a very sort of strong religious foundation? I mean, is it Southern Baptist? We, I mean, we, we've mentioned that in passing, but like regular church attendance and the kind, uh, was that part of the, of, of the family background or not so much? Uh, with my grandparents, you know, okay. with my parents, um, I think they were culturally Christian. Christian. You know, they would say they were Christian, but they didn't make me go to church a lot. I mean, I went to church a little bit with my grandmother, but my parents were more, not secular humanists, but um, I think they would consider themselves Christian, but they would say, you know, just don't lie, steal, cheat. So they try to instill that in me, but um, they weren't making me go to church. And and uh, my father did encourage me as I got a little older to just listen to both sides of the story and then reflect on it and make up your own mind. So that's a hmm. huge gift from my father. Yeah, uh, certainly. Now, would you say your grandparents uh, like Southern Baptist proper, or are we maybe some Pentecostal or some other like Methodist or something? No, they're Southern Baptist. Yeah. Okay. For, yeah. Okay. And Got back in you know a few generations back, when there were people were farmers, there weren't churches like there there in those rural areas. They didn't have areas. They didn't have churches. It would be whichever traveling preacher would come around with the tent revival. So sometimes it may be Pentecostal, sometimes it may be Baptist, and people would just attend that because they didn't have churches. They may do like a Bible study in their house, but so it wasn't so, uh, wasn't people in certain camps uh, a few generations back. Um, but I guess maybe as people kind of, because you're out in the, a rural area, you know, you're so scattered, out, you're so scattered, there's not going to be. Uh, and maybe probably not having the money to build churches, but as people are starting to leave the farms and move to the cities, then I think maybe people start affiliating, at least these country people start affiliating with 
this church that is Baptist, this church that's Pentecostal. So uh, they ended up being Baptist, you know, but I think a few generations, it would just, whoever, whichever preacher was coming through town, that's who you'd go listen to and try to study with. That That's a fascinating point. Yeah, something I think we forget about, um, you know, even when we talk about Christianity, uh, it, it, whether it's in the South or just in the United States in general, is the whole kind of phenomenon of uh uh, of traveling preachers and you know the the, the, the sort of uh, preacher coming into town and and the uh, uh, in a tent right tent uh, right yeah tent revivals those were right. that was that was a real part of American Christianity right yeah absolutely um, so yeah um, w- what was it you think then that um, if you could, I mean, I know, again, this is always a difficult question and, and one I hate even asking because, again, it is a process and not an event. But, um, you know, what what would you identify in, in Islam that kind of resonated with you the most, whether it's religious, like whether it's theological or whether it was social, um, you know, just if you could name maybe a couple of factors or maybe the factor that kind of just resonated with you. Most definitely. Islam's uh, takes on how you treat other human beings that look different than you, you know, because um, I would really uh, had some conflict with my family, like even being uh, assaulted by calling people out on uh, treating people different based on their complexion, you know, and uh, I've had family members quote the Bible and say, and try to justify that races should be segregated, right? Based on their their reading of the uh, of of the Bible, and then in Islam, I find something that makes a lot more sense to me. It's adding up with what I'm witnessing, and it's telling me that you know white people aren't better than black people, black people aren't better than white people, but it's the the pious people are the best people, and that I knew that in my heart to be true, and I, I'd never run into anything that addressed that issue head on. And that was a huge, huge issue in my life to try to navigate uh, in the environment I was growing up in, which was becoming very mixed because I can remember when black Amer- when when black American families started moving into my neighborhood and like someone spray spray painted racial slurs on their car and someone spray painted racial slurs on their driveway. You know, and I'm probably 12 or 13 years old, but. You know, I was I was there with the uh, the kids of the family try, trying to help scrub that off of their um, of their driveway with some MD twenty twenty. I don't know if you guys know what that is. No. Uh, you know what that is? No. Okay. <laughs> that's that's a. Uh, but anyway, Mogan David twenty twenty. <laughs> Other people will probably know what that is. <laughs> uh, but anyway, yeah. Uh, so that's I was growing up in a totally different world, you know, uh, and. Someone had just vandalized my friend's car, uh, but I, I and I didn't totally understand the situation. I think Eyes on the Prize was shown. It was talking about the civil rights struggle. Yeah, that aired on PBS as I got a, a few years later, and it really kind of started explaining the backstory to why we find ourselves in this very confrontational situation, you know, between different people uh, in Mississippi. Uh, my senior year in high school, we moved out into a little more rural area, and the classroom was literally split down the middle. There was a space in the middle, and all the white people were on one side of the room, and all the black people were on the other side of the room. This is in the late '80s, you know. Really? So, yeah, yeah, man. So, so I, I so, mean, uh, what do you, from your experience, what do you think accounts for? I mean, I'm, I'm trying to figure out the right way to phrase it. Kind of the the slower pace of acclimation to this social change. I don't know if that makes sense. Like, uh, to the extent that I mean, yeah, we're, we're, we're the 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 South uh, was to a large extent the the cauldron uh, from whence the civil rights movement sprang, and yet uh, the pushback there was the the hardest against a lot of those changes and i don't i don't mean to broad brush but i mean obviously uh, what you're describing certainly speaks to that well it seems like i I don't know this is you know i'm not an expert on this subject by any means it's just uh it's fascinating 
to me and it's healing to me to mm. look into this. But it, I mean, in a city, maybe you're forced to interact with each other. But if you're spread out, oh, sure. you could you could probably put a little distance between you and other people. Yeah. And then also probably just the economics of it where, you know, you may be poor, but at least you feel you can feel better than someone. You can get a, self, a sense of self-worth, even though you're poor, that, well, at least maybe I'm better than this person that looks different than me. So on the economic level and then just from a, uh, a space situation, you're not all jammed up. Like I was jammed up with diverse people and we got to know each other and we liked, some of us liked each other, but so when, you have once, the luxury to keep distance between you and other people. Maybe it's harder to make that leap. Uh, yeah. I mean, I mean, certainly yeah. once you get to know uh, and, and understand someone and their particular struggles and everything else, it's a lot harder to, to, you know, uh, sort of confine them to, to stereotypes, certainly. Yeah, maybe it's harder to do that in a city where you're crammed up together. Wow. Also, you know, it's a little, maybe it's harder to maintain that space. Yeah. You know, as the city gets overpopulated and you're going to be standing next to somebody whether you like it or not on the yeah. subway. Potentially, right? But not so in Mississippi. Uh, so, I mean, you're describing the state of affairs uh, 30 years ago, just about, and in, right. from from your lived experience in in the three decades since, uh, would, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming there has been positive change. But do you feel that that the the rate of that change has been slower than perhaps in the rest of the country, even even since then? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Yeah, I'm not sure I know the answer to that. Um, <laughs> I don't know if it's just people are maybe more vocal about how they actually feel. Maybe, you know, I think people in California, there's some people in California, they, they had the same attitude as the, the person in the woods in Mississippi, yeah. but they just have to be a little more polite about they, it. They know what not to say, or they, they, I mean, there, there's, this, right. there's a, there's that sense of, you know, it's kind of like the social media effect, right? Where if you, if you are surround, if you interact with people on social media who, who, uh, you know, regularly put out bigoted views or, or sexist views or whatever, then you sort of assume that that is quote unquote normal. Right. So, you know, I mean, because, right. because, you know, obviously we're, what we're seeing lately and, and a lot of polling, uh, seems to indicate that there is a rise in racist views. And, and the, the argument is, well, is there really a rise or is it just people suddenly feel more comfortable saying what maybe has been sort of, you know, nestled in there all along? Yeah, maybe it's that. And if, if, if white people is a shrinking demographic hmm. and maybe you feel, maybe your sense of worth can't just be thinking that you're better than everybody. Like if some people, uh, like you're not doing anything with your life and you see other people thriving, you yeah. know, maybe it's not because maybe, maybe you're not just better than everybody. So maybe people are also having to confront this kind of false narrative that your worth is based on your race. And, um, so what do you have to fall back on? I mean, sure. that's what's interesting to me about trying to not totally write these people off uh, because a lot of these people, they, they have a lot of Islamic values in that in Southern culture. Sure. But uh, the racism and the sexism and a lot of these are, are major issues that are um, uh, standing in the way of, of that person um, succeeding, you know, and mm. uh, taking responsibility for their life. And so, um, and I, I know that that doesn't feel right. That can't feel right to people in their soul, you know, <laughs> yeah. and it, as part of, and you can't, that's not really making meaning out of life. Like you, it's not really giving you the tools to read the signs of God around you, you know? Yeah. And you're not feeling like you're living up to your, I, I know it's I, cause you see these people, uh, the suicide rates are going up and people are really suffering the opioid epidemic in a lot of these communities, you know, people know something's not right in their soul. And part of it is this, this poison that people are carrying around with them, you know, that, um, it's, 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 it's heavy to try to address, you know, it's not, uh, uh, I don't claim to be totally free of all that, you sure. know? but I, I realized that's, I wasn't born that way. You know, that was, that was socialized into me. 
and I need to rid myself of that because this pride and all this stuff, this hurts me as well. It's a poison for me, for my heart, spiritually. And I may, maybe people know this on some level, you know, but um, who's going to maybe offer them point toward a way out or a road to redemption, you know, because I think Islam has so much to offer people, not necessarily that they all convert, but we have a lot of medicine um, that I mm. think I need, we need to figure out how to get to some of these people that are suffering, you know? Right. Now, I think it's a really fascinating point you make about vices and some of these vices being, uh, you know, cer- you know, spiritual vices and, 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 and their causes and their cures are metaphysical. You know, they're not just, you know what I mean? You, you know, you, you, you can't just uh, deal with them uh, in, a, in a sociological sense, but um, truly some real spiritual healing has to take place. And uh, um, is that, you know, and, and that kind of brings me to my question, because I, I think what I found fascinating is right from the jump, um, you know, kind of what, what, what you identified with and, and resonated with in Islam was sort of the maybe the more mystical or Sufi or, um, yeah, like, like the, the rich mystical and Sufi tradition, um, you know, wh- one, I'd love to ask, why is that? <clears throat> and two, um, it, you know, I, I think that, I mean, again, without painting too broad of, 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 of like in, in too broad uh, strokes, um, that is something that at least as people that I've encountered, uh, you know, it, it does seem to resonate with uh, especially white converts is sort of the attraction of mysticism and Sufism, um, you know, and, and so I, I'd be, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on that. That's another good question. I'm not sure I know the answer to that, but, uh, okay. Well, yeah, well I mean, I mean, maybe for you, how about for you? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 I mean, um, you know, some of this is just, um, people struggling just to pay the bills, you know, sometimes you don't have time to reflect about some of this stuff, you know? So it's really interesting discussing this, but um, I think it's just firing on all cylinders of trying to be having a balanced life as far as this, maybe the, the justice aspect of this that was addressed through the hip hop music. And then maybe the, the transcendent dimension that's addressed through some of the, uh, the Islamic spirituality those are just different aspects of a human being, you know? So it's um, maybe to do one to the exclusion of other, you still don't feel like you're balanced. So I think maybe that was uh, just one of the components that, that attracted me uh, to uh, address my spiritual state too. You know, not just like we're talking about how societies function, but what about my relationship with, with God? So, um, yeah. So why Sufism? I uh, I don't know. A lot, you know, a lot of these uh, groups, uh, especially like a lot of the groups where a lot of white people converted in the eighties. Uh, there's a handful of people that came that went that were in this country where a lot yeah. of white people became Muslim with them, and I think they were definitely speaking to people's fitra and not talking so much about external stuff. So, you know, we have the we have the freedom to uh, do anything we want. So I was looking how to be happy. You know, people looking how to be at peace and be happy. And um, I think kind of addressing that and the people having the wisdom to understand that's where people are at, meeting the people where they're at and slowly letting them, you know, wake up in the middle of the night to pray and fast during, you know, Ramadan. If I knew all that to start with, I probably wouldn't, want anything to do with that, you know, because, um, that's taken away from my, my idea of what it means to be free. But, um, yeah, that's a great question. That's a great question. Yeah. I mean, because, you know, and again, I, I don't, I certainly don't know the answer. And I mean, I think the more people we have on the show and, and offer their viewpoints, I, you know, I think we can enrich the conversation, but I, I think sure. it would be, it, it's not, me being stereotypical or even painting in too broad of a stroke when I, when I do say, or I make the assertion that, you know, you just don't see the kind of, uh, 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 uh attraction to say Salafism or, uh, or, or Islamic political ideology, 
among white converts the way you do among, say, even black converts or, or certainly among people of, uh, of, of immigrant backgrounds. So I, I, I find that really fascinating. And I think certainly here in America, you know, you can there, there like you mentioned, there was people in the in the in the in the uh, in the eighties who converted, but I would even take it back further. I mean, people who converted in, in the seventies um, and and even late sixties. I mean, we've had people like Hakeem Marchaletta on, and and you know, uh, Dr. Omar, and and so you know, they are not they're not unique, and they're not uh, uh, you know, I would I would argue that they're more representative of the kind of conversion we see among white among white Americans. So anyway, just to, just yeah, to, you know, it, it could, it could be too, that they're seeking balance because some of, some of white, you know, white religious experience, it may be very focused on externals and orthopraxy, right? So they are, they may have been in a situation where it did feel very rigid and ritualistic, devoid of spirituality. So seeking some balance in their religious experience, you know, because a lot of different yeah. denominations of Christianity, it's very much, you need to pray exactly the right way. You need to hold your hands exactly the right way. You need to mm -hmm. dress exactly the right way. And it's not really talking about your relationship with God. It's more focused on ritual. So trying to look for some balance may, may have something to do with it too, you know? Perhaps. Yeah. 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 Um, I think, yeah, again, just, I think it's a, it's a fascinating conversation. Um, sure. Uh, and, and, and for, as someone who follows you on social media, you know, um, uh, maybe some, uh, some conversation or a topic to be discussed at, at this, uh, um, you know, uh, to be determined, uh, white American Muslim conference, right? <laughs> you just had to say that, didn't you? I did. I did. I had to take it there. So I, I think, but I mean, you know, I, and, and I bring that up almost in joke or jokingly, but I think, I think that's an important conversation to have is that, is that, you know, why not? Why, because I, there are certainly experiences that are unique to white American Muslims. And so why not have a conversation among white American Muslims about issues that are specific to them? And, you know, I mean, we're, we're, we're recording this. I mean, the last guest we had, had on the show was literally the last show that we did was with Dr. Abdullah bin Hamid Ali. And, you know, we were talking about the first sort of black American Muslim conference. And so, you know, I, I think you I don't know if you I don't know if the impetus was kind of to, to, to just strike a conversation or you were joking. But um, when, when you did pose that question on social media, but I think that, that I think it's an important one. Yeah, I'll never tell what my intention was. Okay, well, but, uh, regardless of no, the no, intention, yeah, I mean, it's certainly it's very, engendered a lot of conversation yeah. on your on your on your social media feed. Yes, I mean, if you, I've looked through every single comment, and I want to really sit with every single comment. I mean, even if there wasn't a conference, just the conversation, and I think maybe the blind spots that people were made aware of, there were people reacting very, there were knee jerk reactions on both extremes. And I think as these people started talking, I think they maybe became aware of uh, some of their blind spots, you know, really fascinating conversations. And I think some very healing conversations just by just throwing that out there and getting a, and getting a conversation started has been, has been powerful uh, for me to, to look at this and uh, yeah, maybe that's something, but definitely these, these conversations needed to take place or people wouldn't be so, uh, energized about it, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, one of the things you point out is, uh, is, uh, you know, oh, Hey, it's fascinating that a lot of the pushback to this very idea has been from white folks, <laughs> you know, and not, and not non-white. So kind of interesting there as well. Don't make me think about whiteness or what that means <laughs> or yeah, that's supposed to be invisible, right? The norm we measure everyone else in the world by. Wow. Right? I mean, yeah, yeah. But no, that's not. But yeah, uh, maybe some people never. Have, and, I've, you know, it's interesting. Some of the advice people have given me, uh -huh. it's, it's really interesting. Yeah, some of the people are telling me, you need to go, you should go do this. You could go do that. But I think maybe me even putting that out there just to get the conversation going, it's because I went and did some training with Pot Leaf. And it's because I sat with Dr. Jackson at an island program or or went to one of the, you know, the African American Islamic summit or that I'm plugged into a WD Muhammad masjid. You know, I think it's the fruit of that 
interaction and conversation and, and being inspired uh, to try to, to be of service to people that are, they're suffering, you know, and they're, they're, mm-hmm. they're, they, they, they are not outside the, the reach of Allah's mercy either, you know? So uh, some of our families, you know, we can't, we can't just write people off, you know, because just look, it just, I think I'm a, I'm a good example that Allah is very merciful. Allah can, we know Allah can change a person in a heartbeat. Right. So, but uh, I think probably that's my, that's probably one of my tasks to, to, to think about that and work on that, you know? Right. Right. Uh, yeah, there you go. Um, I, I'd love for you to talk about kind of some of the work that you do as uh, in your chaplaincy and kind of what led to that. And did you, you, you alluded to like training at Tetleaf and, and, and things like that. But I mean, I imagine there was more rigid, I mean, there was more, uh, you know, training even beyond just uh, attending Tat Leaf's program. Yeah, well, I was I was in the medical field for twenty years. I, I made prosthetic limbs, and wow. um, okay during that time, I had my wife and I. We had our daughters Nadira and Husna passed away when they were they were young babies. I'm so and, sorry uh, to hear that. Yeah, yeah. So this is where. I, I found out what a chaplain was in the hospital, mm. what a chaplain does. And mm. uh, it was just in the back of my mind. I'd really like to be that person for someone. You know, it was a really fascinating, like modern professional chaplaincy. Because um, uh, it's very much you're dealing with people from all different backgrounds and you're helping them uh, make sense, use their own tools to make meaning out of life, to understand to read the signs of God, you know, through their lens. So it was a be- really beautiful way to serve. Uh, and so I was hoping to do a program called clinical pastoral education. So this is that most major hospitals will have a, a program where most, most, most people have like an, a master's of divinity to get into this program. But you learn a lot of counseling skills and you get on the ground training where you're dealing with people all day long where, Someone just found out they had cancer. Someone's child just died. Someone's mother passed away. So you get, you know, hundreds of hours of clinical experience sitting with people at, on the worst day of their life. So I went yeah. through it was about a year and a half of I did an internship, like a four month in, internship at UNC Medical Center. And then I went to Talis in, in between the break. And then I went, came back and did a year residency there. And that was kind of some of the background before I, I got into working in higher education, which is a totally different animal than uh, being in the hospital, but working in higher education as a chaplain. Yes. You know, it, it's, yeah. I'm, my title is Muslim life coordinator. So it's, um, you know, and, oh. I, I, and as I'm doing this, I'm seeing what, what a Muslim chaplain or a Muslim life coordinator, what they do. It's, it's, it's very diverse depending on, what part of the country you're in and the demographic of the students. So I'm doing a lot of education just about the, just about the basics of Islam. I have a small uh, number of Muslim students on campus that, uh, that I work with. And then, you know, we do programming. It's not all counseling type of type of uh, work as the hospital is much more similar to counseling or pastoral care. That's one aspect of being at the university I'm at, but part of it's education and uh, programming. Like we had Sheikh Mohammed Mendez was there last year for our big interfaith mindfulness conference, and everyone loved being with him. And this year, uh, Brother Ali's going to come and have some discussion and performance uh, on the campus. So it's yeah. it's cool you get to kind of help facilitate some really beautiful conversations as well. So. What campus is this for our listeners? Just it's so Elon you know. University. Elon and University. it's in North Carolina. Right, right. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it's about 6,500 students to liberal arts college in North Carolina. Yeah. Okay, okay. Um, now, you know, maybe to kind of as we close out the conversation, um, I, I'd love for you to kind of talk about um, you being the subject of this uh, upcoming documentary and uh, – Maybe kind of tell us about the documentary. Yeah, well, Jennifer Taylor, who made New Muslim Cool. Yeah. She's made some other really cool uh, 
films. I think what she said, she just saw me comment on a, on a mutual friend's post and she just clicked, clicked my profile on Facebook and started reading. So like, Oh, that's, that's a kind of quirky. That's a, that's a, that's a, you know, an interesting character. And so, uh, I think she talked to Mustafa Davis about maybe, uh, doing a short film. And I think maybe at the time the idea was to maybe do a series of shorts on American Muslims that are kind of outside what people would normally, what, what would normally come to people's mind when they think of Muslims in America, just to show the diversity, uh, of our community. But, um, so they, yeah, they reached out to me and it was very awkward, you know, uh, to even consider there's a lot of intimate things that we've talked about here and that are in that short film. But, uh, uh, it, it, it seemed like, um, it could be a good conversation starter. Some, of, some of what we brought up today is super difficult to talk about. And I'm not, I'm not saying that I have all this figured out that, that I could be wrong about some of the things I'm saying. I'm open to that, but, um, it seemed like it could definitely, uh, open up the conversation to address some of these issues, uh, the issue of race in America and the issue of uh, people not totally turning away from their, their past and how to uh, reconcile their past and how to integrate uh, becoming Muslim with whatever background you have and not as Dr. Umar talks about committing cultural apostasy and uh, apostasy. Right. So, so, so I thought it was, it was, it was interesting way to uh, share, let people in on some of these conversations that are happening and some of the, the things on the ground people are trying to navigate, you know? Yeah. And then just beyond just you being a representative of your race, let's say, right. I mean, uh, as, as a subject of the, of the, of the uh, documentary, uh, I, I, do you explore issues of trauma? I mean, I mean, certainly, you know, I, I mean, we don't have to necessarily talk in the detail, but I mean, you know, the, like the loss of a child or, or in this case, two children, I mean, you know, that, I mean, that, I mean, you can just, I, I can't even imagine sort of responding to that. And, and then, you know, how you allow your faith to kind of guide you through that. I mean, again, you know, you don't have to necessarily get into the details if you don't, if you're not comfortable with that. But I mean, you know, I, I didn't mean to kind of gloss over it um, because, uh, you know, I, I think that's a, that's a very important conversation as well to be had because, I mean, people are people are hurting out there i mean and it's it may not be at the level of losing a child but i mean it's certainly people are hurting and so people deal with trauma in different ways uh and i imagine right. that's certainly something you deal with as a chaplain sure sure i mean there's only so much you can get in a 15 minute film right because we probably filmed for a week and uh, you know everything's not really uh explained in full, but you, you know, you only have a few minutes to have a, you know, you're having an off the cuff, cuff discussion really with this 15 minute short. But, um, yeah, I think giving people the permission to grieve and understanding that, uh, that's not a lack of faith, you know, that, uh, who we believe is the best human. That's an example for us. Peace be upon him. He cried and he grieved when he lost his son, you know, he submitted to that. He didn't fight that, but, uh, this is part of being a human being and uh, giving people that permission and space to do that. And then we didn't we didn't get that in depth. And I think also just the whole filming process was helping me put myself back together and kind of uh, take my path and where I am now and uh, and put it back together instead of compartmentalizing. But uh, I think definitely folks from my background. Uh, there's something gnawing at us. And I think we had to betray our fitra at some point to toe the line. And we're, we're going to have to address that, you know, to be become whole, you know, to be who we are, to be fully who we are. That's a big thing to be, accept yourself and be fully who you are and then submit that self to God, you know? So hopefully we're moving in that direction. Hopefully. Uh, it, it yeah, right, right. Um, is there a is there a title for the, a working title for the uh, for the documentary? Redneck Muslim. 
<laughs> nice. I love it. <laughs> Zach loves it. So uh, you, you, you've got a film critic who already approves the title, so that helps. Uh, but yeah, I mean, attention. Yeah. Well, there you go. It, it, does. it absolutely does. Yeah. yeah. You're not bearing the lead, yeah. certainly. Yeah. <laughs> Is is it possible that, that uh, some of our listeners are going to be able to see this uh, uh, documentary soon? I, has there been conversations? Well, we're with... taking this to film festivals. I'm in Minneapolis. I'm at the Minneapolis St. Paul International Film Festival this weekend. That's why I'm snowed in up here. And uh, we've been to we we're taking it to different film festivals. There's different uh, networks that are looking at it, and so it's it's more than likely it's going to be it's going to be uh, I'm not sure which network. It's going to be beyond, but it's it's going to be out uh, very soon, from what I hear. So, well, very cool. I mean, I I think uh, I think that's a good place to to leave our audience wanting more. Hopefully, uh, with with word that uh, this documentary is going to be coming, I think that's fascinating, and I I hope it it gets a lot of eyeballs from people who who might not necessarily uh, equate the words redneck and Muslim. There you go. Sure, I mean, yeah. I, mean, I think country music television was one venue that we had talked about. It'd be interesting to put it on, right? <laughs> Can yeah. you imagine? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Not, you know, not. Uh, there's enough people preaching to the choir. I think so. These these type of conversations are very interesting to me. You know, reaching beyond the people that already agree with us and starting some conversations. I think where the real work's at. You know, so. Yeah. But, yeah. yeah. Inshallah, it'll tofik. Inshallah, you know. Well, yeah. Yes. Yeah, no. In in addition to the documentary, um, do you have anything else that uh, you want to make our audience aware of uh, while we have you? I think that's it. I think that's it, guys. Uh, yeah, I do. I do work. Southern Hospitality Islamic Center is our initiative on the ground here. It's similar to like a, maybe a center DC. It's kind of like a pop up Islamic Center where I do work with. That's the platform that I I try to serve the convert community here in North Carolina through uh, Southern Hospitality Islamic Center. So that's another, it. that's another one of uh, the things we've been doing uh, that we're working on. So, yeah. So I, I love, I love the name. Yeah. Southern Hospitality Islamic Center. That's a, That's great. That's great. I mean, it, it, you know, you, you, you kind of mentioned it earlier, but it's like, you know, kind of using your own background and roots to, 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 to kind of inform the work you do and, and, and not, to uh, you know, to kind of shy away from your own background. So I mean, I, I love it. I love it. Um, I, I I wish more people did that, and more people kind of used uh, their own um, you know not only life experiences but just you know who, who they are to kind of inform the work they do in a very meaningful way. So um, thank you for that. Um, maybe uh, as we close out, also where can people find you, engage you, uh, have a conversation if they wanted to reach out to you? Well, I'm on Facebook, and the uh, the, the uh, so, so Southern Islam is Southern Hospitality Islamic Center's uh, page, and there's a you can communicate through the web to that website as well. So. Okay, okay, great. Yeah. Um, are you on any other social media platform where people can maybe reach out? I, I'm on Twitter. It's Empathy and Coffee because those are <laughs> when I was in the hospital. Those were the two most important things. Empathy and coffee, because you're doing a lot of all-nighters. But uh, I'm an old dude. I'm kind of not in the loop about social media stuff, so I'm trying to get up to speed. But uh, I'm on Facebook, so yeah. I love it. I love it. Yeah, Southern Hospitality meets Empathy and Coffee, man. You know, sign me up. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> that is awesome. Okay. Well, um, Shane, can't thank you enough. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, really, Godspeed with all your endeavors, uh, not only with the documentary, I mean. but also – you know, um, you know, if you if you need volunteers to help put this, uh, you know, white American Muslim conference together, uh, sign me up too, man. Because I think, um, you know, I think the the more you know our, our community engages in these conversations beyond just the rhetoric and beyond just the fluff, um, and, and really wants to have meaningful conversations that um, may not be comfortable but need to be had. Uh, you know, I'm all for that, man. So I think. Uh, I think it's wonderful, and uh, you know whatever this little podcast here can do to help 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 promote the work you're doing, we'd love to do it. So thank you. Well, thank you guys, and we we, we don't need to be shy to try to help people that are suffering. You know whether they're Muslim or not, Allah blessed us, and we have a lot of medicine 
that in in light we need to share with people. People are people are suffering. So whatever whatever form that takes, we 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 need to be active. You know, we really do. So thank you guys for your service too. Oh no, well thank you, and and I think you know I I want to actually link this, and, and we didn't really talk a lot about it, but I mean you know I want you to continue singing because I, you have a beautiful voice, and 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 people can uh, seek out the YouTube video of you uh, singing a, um, a, a a Muslim spiritual, but in the in the in the in the in the vein of a of a Southern spiritual, and I think that's I think that's beautiful, man. That's the kind of cultural production that. Dr. Jackson, Dr. Omar talk about, right? Islam and the cultural imperative. So uh, again, Godspeed in that regard as well. Flattery will get you everywhere. Yeah, so that's, <laughs> that's Southern Salawat on YouTube and the American Maulid Project is a website. Yeah. So I'm, I'm putting this music up there for free. So I'm not, you don't have to pay to download this. There's the lyrics, there's music. So maybe these will be, become part of the, the canon of songs that are sung. By our children, you know, down the down the road. Who knows? Yeah, God you know, willing, but, uh, man. Inshallah, it's there for free. So, yeah, that's right. Thank you. Uh, what, what were those Thank sites again? Thank you. No, no. What was that again? American Maulid Project hmm? is where you, where that Southern Salawat that that song is there. The lyrics are there. And my intention was to put up a few more songs, Please maybe do. more geared towards singing as a group, and and just have this where people can access English language. Uh, Islamic music for free. So, thank you, thank yeah. you. Uh, people forget how music has has served uh, throughout not only human human civilization, but certainly Muslim civilization to spread to to to, to kind of spread the truth and the meaning of Islam. So, uh, absolutely, absolutely. Thank you. Um, and uh, Zaki, where can people find us? Uh, maybe you can speak to that a little bit. And uh, I, I want to, and then maybe it kind of bounce it back to me. I wanted to thank uh, uh, our patrons who continue to support the work that we're doing on the podcast. Well, uh, you can reach out to us on Facebook, facebook.com slash Diffuse Congruence. You can also email us at Diffuse Congruence at gmail.com. You can also follow us individually on Twitter. Uh, you can find me at Zeki's Corner, Z A K I S Corner. And Pervez, you are at? I'm at Pervez F. Ahmed. And uh, as far, I'm sorry, as I was saying, I wanted to, you know, uh, a shout out to uh, all the people who do continue to reach out to us on our on our uh, Patreon page. Uh, please continue to do so and uh, please support the work that the, that the podcast is uh, not only doing, but attempting to do so. Uh, go to patreon.com slash diffuse congruence and uh, become a monthly patron today. There we go. Well, uh, with that, we're going to wrap up this episode. Big thanks to our guest, Shane Atkinson, for coming on. And on behalf of my co-host, Pervez Ahmed, my name is Zaki Hassan. This has been Diffuse Congruence. We'll catch you next time. Thank you for listening. Thank <laughs> you.